Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum, dear participants. So today we are starting off with a series which is called Moral Lessons from the Quran. Basically, uh, every in every session, I will be selecting a couple of verses from the Quran, and uh, these verses, these selected verses, uh, would actually relate to some moral or ethical message which the Quran keeps giving uh, its believers. And uh, as we have been discussing this in our various sessions, that as far as morality is concerned, it is not that the Quran is uh, for the first time pointing out certain moral issues or certain moral teachings, because these moral teachings are ingrained in us. So what the Quran actually does is that it uh, reminds us of those moral teachings which we have, uh, which we already have in our uh, innate guidance. So I'll start off with today's uh, selected passage. It is from uh, the uh, 25th surah of the Quran, which is Surah Furqan. I'm just going to share the screen with you so that you can see its text as well. And uh, you'll realize that how, uh, how subtly the Quran at times conveys its meaning and how forcefully this meaning is actually uh, implanted in our own uh, minds and souls. So you can see the words of the Quran. This is Surah Al Furqan, the 25th Surah, and you have verses 63 to 67 being displayed before you. The words are Waibadu Rahman al Lazina Yamshuna al Al Arabi Hauna, Waiza Hata Bahumul Jahiluna Kalu Salama. And the servants of the Most Merciful are ones who walk humbly on earth, and when people overcome with emotions, argue with them, they go away by saying Salam to them. So this is uh, something which the Quran has emphasized at a number of instances, at a number of places, that the first impression that you get of a person is the way he or she walks. And the gait that you can see of a person is the foremost reflection of his or her inner self. And the Quran here says that the servants of the Most Merciful, which it calls Ibadur Rahman, they are ones who walk on this earth in a very humble way. They are ones who never, I mean, out of their own personal and their own persona, they never reflect arrogance or haughtiness or any element of pride. Uh, they, they reflect humility. They reflect that they are servants of the Almighty who have been created by Him. And if they have any quality, if they have any attributes, if they have anything to be proud of, it's basically God-given. So in all these uh, issues, they actually attribute whatever they have to the person of God, and uh, they don't claim any credit for their own selves. And this actually speaks of their humility. So the verse says, They are the ones who walk very humbly on earth. They don't walk stamping their feet or in a manner that the other person or people who view them think that, well, here's a person who is walking in a way that he or she thinks that, well, uh, there's no one uh, no one superior to him or her. And the other thing which the verse actually points out is, it says that, uh, Now in the, Arab, in the Arabic language, the word jahil uh, is also used for someone who is overcome with emotions, who is in an emotional frenzy. So it's not just ignorance that the word jahil means, which is generally its meaning in the Urdu language, but in Arabic it has two meanings. One of them is, the person who is, of course, ignorant, and the other one who is who is overcome by frenzy, uh, or in a state of uh, emotional frenzy, and it is here uh, in this in these verses that it is used in this uh, meaning as well. So the words is that instead of entangling with people uh, who are Im overcome with emotions, instead instead of uh, uh, I mean arguing with them, what they do is they just back away because there is no use arguing with people. There is no use. Uh, entangling ourselves with people who would like to engage in a heated discussion. And this requires a lot of humility. And this is an, actually a manifestation of humility because you see, it's very difficult to control our ego when someone is talking to us in a very ill-mannered way, in a very impetuous way. So what we feel is that we would like to immediately reply to that person and not only reply to that person, we would like to actually tick him off or uh, pay back in equal coins. But you look what the Quran says. It says, well, the best way for people to counter such arrogance and such uh, unseemly behavior is to just back away and not just back away, 
the Quran says that Qalu Salama. They politely they should, they should just wish peace because Salaamu Alaikum is the biggest prayer of peace that a believer can offer to any other person. So not only do they withdraw in any amount of, I mean, they don't withdraw in any amount of scorn or disdain or hate. They actually withdraw by praying for that person. Like, look, my brother or my sister, it's not becoming for you to use these words. And it would be equally bad if I reply to you in these words. So I'm going to withdraw and not going to withdraw in any state of emotional anger. I'm going to pray for you. And the biggest prayer that you can imagine is Assalamu Alaikum, which would see, which would actually convey our own uh, well wish and the fact that we would uh, like that person to calm down and see what he or she is uttering. And the best antidote, uh, my dear participants, I'm sure you would agree, whenever there is an argument, whether it's between two strangers or whether it's between people who are well known to each other, is that one of them, especially the one who is perhaps bearing the brunt of that conversation and who's not angry, uh, should just back away, should just withdraw from that scene and let the other person think that he or she has not done the right thing by becoming angry. Because things are never solved through an emotional uh, outburst. They are always solved in a calm way, in a way that you are able to convey your own emotions. So it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of wisdom to be silent on such occasions, to withdraw from such occasions and to wish peace uh, to the person who is annoyed. But then this is what the Almighty says that Ibadur Rahman or my servants or the servants of the most merciful, such is their quality, such is their trait that they don't react. They don't uh, respond to the person who is in such an angry uh, frame of mind that he or she does not even know what he or she or she is talking about. So this is the first thing which uh, which the Quran points out regarding the most merciful servants. And then the Quran continues with its uh, uh, with its uh, sermonizing, as I would say in this particular verse. And the words it then says is وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا they are ones who spend the nights while prostrating and, stand, and standing before their Lord. So, وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Of course, is something which is an outstanding expression of the same humility that the verses previous to this verse actually they began with. It was said that there are people who are humble, they walk humbly on earth. And one expression of this humility is that they wake up at night. And they wake up at night and they spend their nights in prostration. In prostration and in standing in the prayer before the Almighty. And my dear participants, in this blessed month of Ramadan, it does become easy for us to wake up before Fajr when we are, all of us are generally awake at the Sehri time when we are eating our meals. So just before finishing off our Sehri or even starting our Sehri, uh, a, a very recommended practice here would be to offer the night prayer, the tahajjud prayer, which in fact the Quran says that this is how they spend their nights generally. I mean, not just in Ramadan, but generally the servants of the most merciful, they spend their nights while prostrating and standing in the presence of God in the prayer. And what makes them stand and prostrate at night? Of course, this is uh, this is a question that the Quran has given an answer to elsewhere and says that uh, they are ones who stand in fear and in gratitude. Fear that they are ones who might do something which might uh, displease the Almighty. And gratitude uh, because of the fact there are so many favors which the Almighty has blessed them with, which they can simply not even account for. And when they stand up at night, they thank him profusely. They thank him with all their mind, with all their soul. And with all their heart that God, you have been looking after us in such a profound way, in such a tremendous way. We could not even even be Im imagine the extent of mercy, the extent of compassion, the blessings that we all uh, witness all around us every day. We see the earth, we see the mountains, we see the sky, the breeze, the wind, uh, all the elements of nature serving us. Then we see our own selves as human beings 
uh, serving functions, our own body, our own faculties, they are such that they serve ourselves and uh, make us follow through a very, very relaxed, if we want to, so to speak, a very relaxed routine in life, if we can use our faculties for that. And we have our extended family, we are, have mothers, we, all of us have mothers at home, or generally we do have uh, fathers and brothers and sisters and siblings and children, and of course, extended family who make our lives so comfortable and we can fall back on their shoulders. And if, all of this is basically God's doing, is God's creation. He's standing behind all these blessings that we have. So we need to remember that, that the, the thing that can motivate us every night to stand up is to offer our gratitude, to, to pay our thanks to the Almighty, and also to ask for forg forgiveness of our sins that we might not be very proud of. This is a huge motivation that uh, makes us rise or should make us rise. And as I said today in, uh, in, the, in the Ramadan, we all of us have this opportunity to pray the night prayer and uh, offer our own gratitude in this way. And at the same time, this actually accounts for a very strong God connection. And this st strong God connection is something that can really go very, very far. It can go a long way for the rest of those 11 months in which we, of course, would be interacting and doing things that we might need to actually uh, rectify. And then look what the Quran has uh, said after that. Not only does the Quran say that the people of uh, the, other, or the servants of God are those who walk humbly on earth and they uh, wish peace to people who are in frenzy. And it says that they spend their nights in prostration and in standing before God. It says, That they are the ones who, standing in their prayer at night, they, they, they ask the Almighty that please forgive us for our extravagance in our sins, for excesses that we have committed. We have uh, done something that we are not very proud of. But you are the, the great forgiver. So what, this is what they say in their night prayer, and not only in their night prayer, whenever they get a chance to pray before the Almighty. Uh, this is their, their uh, stipulated and their standard conversation with God, that please forgive us for what we have done uh, against what are the norms and against what are the uh, norms of decency that uh, we might not be very proud of. So, uh, that, oh God, please make us stay away from this, this fire of hell. Because such is this fire of hell that it sticks to a person whenever a person is cast into hell. Of course, portraying the fact that how ominous and how, how horrific punishment uh, the, the punishment of hell would be. And may God save us, save all of us from this punishment. But as I said, that this is what the uh, what what makes them stand up at night, that to ask for forgiveness and at the same time show gratitude for what the Almighty has done to us, and also strengthen relationship with the, with our Creator, so that in future uh, endeavors in our future life or in our life, which is the post Ramzan period, we are able to always pick the right and always dismiss the wrong because these this is a decision that each one of us makes every now and then almost uh, in you know in, whenever we go pass through our daily routines the question that if we're doing something is right or wrong crops up every now and then and it is this strong relationship with the almighty which actually guarantees this that we are able to do something uh, that we are that we boast, but we can boast of and be proud of that. Yes, we chose what the right was, what the right path was uh, when the time came. Okay, uh, then the next verse also takes up cue from the, the from the previous words, and what it says is that "Wallazina iza anfaku lam yusrifu walam yakturu wakana bayna zalika fawama." And even before that. Uh, the verse 66, as you can say, is a follow-up on verse 65 when it says in Nahasa at Mustaqarra wa Muqama that if we end up in hell, then of course it's a very evil abode for staying and living. Sa at Mustaqarra wa Muqama. So this is how they feel about the punishment of hell. And then what another attribute of the servants of the Almighty, the servants of the most merciful, is mentioned. Well Lazina is a anfaku lam yusrifu wa lam yakturu wa kana bayna zalika qawama. And such are they that when they spend 
they are neither extravagant nor stingy and they adopt the way of moderation in between it so you see one of the things that uh, accounts for our arrogance is that we tend to show off and this show off is done through extravagance to to buying things which are of not necessarily our needs now they are beyond our needs and much beyond that so the quran says that such are the people or such are the servants of the almighty that they spend in moderation they don't overspend is a anfaqu lam yusrifu neither do they overspend wa lam yaqturu nor they are they stingy they are not stingy uh, they are, they are, they don't withhold or hold back their needs uh, or, or don't spend on others no what they do is they spend in moderation and moderation is something i i'm sure all of you would agree is is the name of is is the need of the r that we should not commit excesses we should think whatever our needs are we should carefully evaluate our needs and if we fulfill our needs then this is what the almighty we would become extremely happy about but if we go far beyond our needs way beyond our needs start showing indulgence in life and uh, spending in extravagance because what happens is that when one becomes extravagant uh, the greatest toll that it takes is that we forget the needs of the people around us because extravagance does not let us think about others we are always thinking about spending on our own selves and our own needs so it's a great hindrance in 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 expressing our uh, our compassion and our kindness towards others it's it virtually is like a curtain which falls before our eyes and we are just not able to look beyond our own needs and to look about others to think about others to leap out for others is something which religions of god have always and always recommended so the, these verses finish finish off by this beautiful advice that when we spend we should spend out of moderation and of course we should not be stingy we should not be over over spending in our in our needs uh, and this is the reason that if we underspend or we are, we are stingy then actually we have not thank god enough for the favors and the bounties that he has bestowed on us because if he has given us then the reason for that bestowal is that we spend that amount on others as well of course spending on our own selves is not a, is, is certainly not prohibited but withholding this uh, the amount that we have from others is something which all of us need to be very careful about very very uh, concerned about that whatever we have which is over and beyond our needs whether they are of, of the present or of the future whether they are personal or they are our business needs whatever is spare is something that we should be very very careful and always think about how the wealth that we have saved up can be of benefit to others so this is uh, the passage that i wanted to bring to your notice these verses from surah furqan and uh, it would be good if you could memorize these verses because they, these are the verses that motivate us they really uh, make us think that well this is what life is actually about that we have to be humble we have to connect ourselves to god and no better a month than the month of ramadan and at the same time uh, always think that we are blessed if god has given us resources and wealth and we must share our resources and wealth with the people around us so i will end my talk here and uh, would be available for any questions that you might have Assalamu alaikum. Thank you Dr. Shahzad for an enlightening session from Surah Furqan with some personal and practice advice. I'll just go through some housekeeping rules first. Uh please note the following housekeeping rules. The maximum duration is 30 minutes. And the first round only one question per participant will be addressed and in it time allows we will be going for other sessions as well. Um so for I have just one raised hand right now. Halima Ali, you can go ahead. Assalamu alaikum sir I have a question regarding that as a female member we are supposed to be act in a bit rude way or inhospitable towards the opposite gender so while doing this sometimes uh, we give a gesture of uh, uh, attitude or being egoistic so is this right thank you in the, in the first place why should you be rude to uh, people who are unrelated why why at all i i think if you uh, derive this from a certain quranic verse uh, that has a very specific context otherwise uh, they must be very very uh, careful i mean very polite when they talk to people and uh, i i don't see any reason that you should be rude or 
uh, show an attitude when someone talks to you, especially of the opposite gender. Yes, Dania, go ahead. Halima, I'll take your question after Dania. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Am I audible to you? Yes, you are. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit confused about the uh, cultural norm that we have here in Pakistan uh, and some of the religious practices. If we talk mm -hmm. about showing courtesy and kindness towards others, but mm -hmm. uh, in a culture where we are living, if we are so much kind, kind towards others, then somehow people are just uh, to take us uh, for granted, or you can say um, they may show us some disrespectful attitude as well. So, how to create some certain boundaries uh, of this respect? Uh, you can say of this self-respect, because when we, uh, while living in this culture of uh, Pakistan, um, showing too much respect is not very much welcoming here. Mm -hmm. But I have observed. Yes, this is very unfortunate. Otherwise, you see, uh, uh, as a human being, we should realize that respect is one of the greatest uh, uh, attributes that, that a person should actually uh, show or profess before others. This respect is something which is equally important for elders, equally important to, towards strangers, equally important towards our colleagues, uh, our uh, friends. I mean, every person in the society uh, who comes in contact with us. This is very important for unfortunate that when women show this respect or this politeness towards others, uh, others think that they can take advantage of this politeness and they think that perhaps that lady is uh, wanting something in return. So I think this is, uh, this is really an issue in, uh, in certain societies, uh, certain third world countries. And yes, uh, I would say that in many cultures, because Pakistan itself is a is a multicultural place and in, in some of the cultures within Pakistan, this is construed as, uh, as I mean, as showing, as becoming more uh, closer or, or a means to become more close or showing more frankness towards the opposite gender. So in such case, of course, because cultural norms have to be taken into care as well, I think the, uh, a polite way of, uh, I mean, going through in which you are not showing the other person any uh, anything which is uh, beyond uh, the norms of decency, if you do so, uh, this is nothing wrong. And if the other person, uh, as a result, takes any undue advantage or says something which is mean, uh, again, you have to politely say that uh, this is something that you would never condone and you would like uh, to disengage with that person. So I think uh, it, you have to be polite. And if that politeness is answered by by a flirtatious attitude, if I might, if I, if I might say, uh, then you have to just politely disengage from that person. And again, when you disengage, uh, uh, rudeness should not be shown. Politely just, just withdraw from the person and give that person a very strong signal that yes, you have respect for humanity, but you have no respect for, for, pe for, for mannerisms uh, which are against decency. So I think, yes, it's, it's, it's a big issue. It's something that women do face but this should not be a cause for them to become disrespectful or rude. It, is, it, should be, it should make them even more polite. And when they think that the other person is taking advantage of them, again, that politeness should be the answer. But be very firm and at the same time use polite words. Teacher? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so okay. my question is that uh, we are asked to lower our gaze uh, while we are talking to the opposite gender. But if you are hearing out a friend or a colleague and mm -hmm. if you don't look towards them while we are talking, so it seems mm -hmm. as if we are not hearing them or maybe we are not paying attention. So right. what are we supposed to do at such times? Uh, well, actually, uh, this is a wrong interpretation of the verse which says that you have to lower your gaze. It actually does not mean that you have to lower your gaze. The words are yabuzum in absarehim, which means that you just you should be uh, staring at the opposite gender with decency. Uh, your gaze and your sight should not take undue liberty. It should not be a stare. It should not start examining the body parts of the opposite gender. Otherwise, loading its gaze is, is not, uh, not a proper translation, I would say. It's a literal translation. The proper translation would be to restrain your gaze. Then men and women should restrain uh, their gazes from taking undue liberty. So here, what we are being told is that you should not stare at the opposite gender, especially uh, making them uncomfortable in a way when you start examining their body contours. But when you're talking to someone by looking at them, you should look at them the way you look at your brother or maybe your, your father uh, or your son. 
because in that gaze you have modesty present so what the quran is actually telling us is we should not be immodest in our gaze neither women should be immodestly staring at the opposite gender nor men should be doing that so i would say that we have to revisit this translation which is uh, which which actually causes a lot of confusion and it's also not the purport of the quran at well and also it's absolutely impractical as well so the, the words of the quran clearly tell us that we have to be modest in our gaze not start uh, staring at the opposite gender in a in a lustful way okay jazakallah khair thank you khadija halima you can ask your next question now thank you uh, sir i have a question regarding the jal that what quran and hadith says about it well the quran does not even mention the word dajjal anywhere uh, at all uh, this is mentioned only in certain ahadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, it is mentioned as a as a sign of the day of judgment and one of the signs of the day of judgment and uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the portions i would say or some of the narratives which mention dajjal actually mention it as al masihud dajjal which would which means false Uh, a false jesus or an antichrist as it is translated so the it does seem that near the end of time there would be a person who would pose himself to be jesus whereas he would not be jesus and uh, he would be the the jal or he would be the person who is deceiving the other person the word the jal literally means the great deceiver the dajjal in arabic means deception so the jal is a, the great deceiver and uh, the certain other ahadith specify that uh, because of the fact that the jews are also waiting for a messiah uh, the christians they are waiting for jesus to return muslims also many of the muslims profess this belief that jesus is going to return again so it does seem that while taking advantage of all these beliefs or of all these three denominations a person near the end of time near the day of judgment would falsely pose himself that i am the messiah or i am the antichrist or i am the person who you have been waiting for so this is as far as we can tell from our, from from those of these narratives but as i said there is nothing which is mentioned regarding the jal uh, in the quran thank you sir so it means that is it is not important for us to believe that the jal has to come right no actually you see it's it's a sign of a day of judgment it's just like telling us that uh, the almighty uh, the almighty's prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the last prophet of god he gave he gave us certain signs regarding the day of judgment he told us that uh, this is such and such thing would happen near the end of time so it's not a question of believing it's just a question of knowing that this is a prophecy this is a prediction made that the near the end of time such and such things would happen and such predictions they always uh, uh are meant to put us on guard that uh, if this something like this arises then we have to uh, think that uh, how the that that uh, prediction if it has materialized uh, the amount of care and caution that we need to exercise in case in that case must not go away from us so these prophecies are generally meant to to make us uh, more vigilant and diligent that if the time or the, the day of judgment is near or if there is such a such an happening which has already been predicted then we should stand on guard and literally if this is the case that there is a person who becomes a false uh, messiah or a false jesus near the end of time we can clearly know that it's a false claim because this is something which was foretold uh, by our prophet so basically it's not a question of belief as much as it is a is a is a prophecy uh to make us realize that the end of times whenever uh, these prophecies are they come true they are near and at the same time the whatever is predicted in these prophecies is something that we have already been foretold of and we should not uh, succumb to them or think that uh, certain things which have been uh, told in these uh, prophecies is are uh, as stopping us from believing in them uh, they are going to guide us uh my question was about the earlier somebody asked about yahud al absar like when it comes in uh, the other place in the quran it says yahud al uh, aswat so it's lower your mm-hmm. voice so lower your mm-hmm. gaze isn't that the literal meaning or is it just the interpretation uh, that it's you said a, earlier that it's not lowering the gaze it's right so yahud al aswat would mean to 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 reduce the tone of your voice it would not mean that you start uh, i mean you don't you take you don't take your voice out i mean it's not like silencing yourself so in a very similar way 
the uh, part when it is discussed in Surah Nur. Uh, what it tells us is that you must not uh, let your gaze take undue liberty. It does not at all mean that you have to lower your eyesight. It is a metaphorical expression to the, uh, of the fact that your eyesight or your gaze should be decent enough. It should have decency in it. It, it is not to be taken literally because even in, in the case where, where you cited uh, or if you say that uh, if you if the Quran says that you have to lower your voice, that again is something uh, which is of a literal phenomena. I mean, there is a voice which is there and you have to lower it. Here, actually, the word is which is used uh, with, with, the, with the with the verb of yaghzuz is is your eyesight, and it is here it is used metaphorically and not in a literal sense. Thank you, Shazia. Samra Harun, you can go now. Um, my question is uh, relating to the Ahle, the differences between Ahle Tashayu and the Sunni uh, sects. And um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we have, naturally, we could have uh, Ahle Tashayu friends as well. So is it permissible or okay to engage with them on the belief uh, issues? Like uh, where could they be wrong in their beliefs or, you know, uh, is it okay to... Um, Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, not just between the Ahlit Ashayu and the Ahlit Asanun, this could be the case with any person who has any belief. He could be an atheist, he could be an agnostic. As, as long as the uh, conversation remains pleasant, it remains within the norms of decency, the discussion in which you're trying to find out the other person's opinion and trying to present your own. So it's, if it's a, it's a amicable discussion, why not? You, you can always indulge in that. It is only when you, you, sh when you feel that the other person is uh, indulging in a heated argument or is not listening or is not open uh, in his or her approach to find out whether the other person has arguments which could be valid or not, should one abstain. Otherwise, I think this is uh, what is what should happen, that if we have a difference of opinion in any, in any matter, it should be politely discussed and, and uh, uh, we should engage with the other person. The only thing is we should not force our opinion on the other person. And the other person should also not force his or her opinion and should take it as an intellectual exercise in which you are exchanging views and you're growing as a result. So when you're finding out the, the reasoning uh, of a particular view, uh, you might be wrong in your own view and uh, that reasoning could actually make you closer to the truth or make you realize that you were uh, believing something which is not correct. So I think a healthy exchange is something that should always be encouraged. The only thing is that you must pick and choose your audience. If the audience or the person that you're discussing it is open to discussion, that is the best way out. But if the person has a closed mind and would not, uh, I mean, listen to you, then there's no use because it's going to be a very unpleasant uh, discussion in that case. Thank you, participants. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shazad. Uh, if there are any closing remarks. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for being here. And inshallah, we'll have this uh, session every uh, day uh, at the same time in Ramadan. And see you all tomorrow, inshallah.